Coming up, celebrating planet Earth. We'll explain the meaning behind Earth Day and what you can do to help. Then we've got the dirt. These students are learning how to compost, and it's a big win for the environment. Okay, so let's move our bodies because we're going to be doing lots of physical activity today in this compost class. Also had a fourth grade class is on a mission to bring an important piece of history back home to Utah. Together we can bring the spikes to Utah. Spikes to Utah! Spikes to Utah! Plus, stepping out. Three lion cubs just made their public debut in Chicago. We're there with all the details. And Golden Strong. These dogs are coming together to honor one of their own and a whole lot more. They're so pure, they're so genuine, they're so loving, and they're just the best friends. Find out what makes this breed so special. This is NBC Nightly News Kids Edition. Welcome back to Nightly News Kids Edition. I'm Lester Holt. It's great to be with you on a Saturday morning. I hope you're having a good weekend so far. We have a super lineup to share with you from our inspiring kids series to lion cubs in Chicago. Plus, a little bit later on, we'll introduce you to this group from Massachusetts who are making kids and grown-ups <laughs> smile thanks in part to their lovable ways. But first, let's begin with an important story on our minds this week. That's the ongoing efforts around the world to help protect the environment. Today is Earth Day, a time to celebrate and raise awareness about planet Earth. And guess what? There are a few simple things you can do to help protect the planet. We get more now from our friend Ann Thompson. Every April, billions of people around the world get together and celebrate planet Earth. The very first Earth Day took place on April 22, 1970. A senator from Wisconsin organized a demonstration to bring attention to environmental issues. By 1990, people in more than 140 countries were celebrating Earth Day, and it's grown bigger ever since. Earth Day is a day to raise awareness about protecting the planet from things like pollution. Pollution is the introduction of harmful materials into the environment. So, for example, like trash you see on the side of the road or in your creek, that's pollution. Oil or chemical spills, those are considered pollution, car exhaust. But also noise can be pollution, right? Like if there's too much sound in the ocean and the whales can't hear each other, that's considered pollution. Or light can be pollution. Then there's deforestation. The forest is an enormously important habitat for so many species. Forests can absorb lots of the planet warming gas, carbon dioxide. They also release oxygen for people to breathe. But when we cut trees down, much of that CO2 is sent back into the atmosphere, making climate change worse. Lots of human activity, like driving cars powered by gasoline and people not properly disposing of garbage, adds to environmental problems. The number of garbage trucks that Americans fill each year would stretch halfway to the moon. So we throw a lot of stuff away. <laughs> Kids like Ryan Hickman are stepping up. He started Ryan's Recycling when he was really young and has been hosting cleanup events in California and beyond for years. This can't be good for animals. Ryan spoke with Lester last year. Does it blow your mind how much trash and, and recyclable materials can be found on a beach like this? Yes, it does. It's sad that people don't pick up after themselves. Just pick it up, it's really easy. I do it all the time. According to the United Nations, one million plastic bottles are purchased every minute and five trillion plastic bags are used across the globe every year. In total, half of all plastic that's produced is single use. That means it's used one time and then thrown away. And that thrown away plastic can end up in the ocean and threaten all types of wildlife. If no one picked that stuff up, what could happen to it? That could go into the ocean and harm an animal. Like a sea turtle could think this is a jellyfish and eat it and then die. So yes, recycling is a really important way you can help protect planet Earth. 
If you wanted to celebrate Earth Day, one idea is to tour your local recycling center. And by touring your local recycling center, you will learn to be a better recycler. And that's important because recycling not only saves energy, for example, one aluminum can that's recycled can power a TV for three hours. And it also means that you're not using raw material. Another thing you can do? It's almost ice cream season. And one easy thing you can do when you're at the ice cream shop is to select a cone instead of a cup. And that's just saving you one piece of trash. Ice cream cups and spoons can be pretty harmful because especially think about it if you're at the beach and you put it in an outdoor can, these pieces of trash are so lightweight that it's very easy for them to blow off the top of the can and go right into the water. And as we talked about, it's really bad for animals to get a hold of that stuff. We love to say that, you know, kids can make an impact. There's so much kids can do. In fact, kids can do a whole lot, like walk or ride a bike rather than ask your parents to drive you turn off lights, TVs, and computers when you are not using them. And you can also host or join a neighborhood cleanup. We just tell kids don't pick up anything sharp or dangerous. Leave it alone. You don't have to pick up everything. And keep asking questions so together we can do a better job of protecting the planet. And thanks so much. And on the subject of protecting planet Earth, some students in California are getting their hands dirty, quite literally, and doing their part to save the environment. It's called composting. Our friend Mimi Geller explains. At 24th Street Elementary in Los Angeles, students are turning garbage into gold, sort of. Are you ready for garden class? Yeah! All right, come on in. It's like hungry, hungry hippos. <laughs> Here, fourth graders are getting their hands dirty, learning about gardening thanks to the Garden School Foundation, an organization teaching kids about the environment. Okay, so let's move our bodies because we're going to be doing lots of physical activity today in this compost class. Today, they're collecting, chopping, chop, 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 and sifting soil okay. to make nutrient-rich compost. It's a lot of work, but you should do it. It's like you could take scraps and instead of throwing it away, you can just use it for other things. But what exactly is composting, and why is composting important? Composting, in its simplest term, is nature's natural way of recycling. It's the planet's ability to break down ingredients into usable resources for the soil around us. Michael Martinez runs LA Compost. When we throw something away, it disappears from our yard, it disappears from our street, but it has a pretty big impact on our planet. If it ends up in landfill, it creates methane, which is a gas that's really not helpful for our atmosphere, which can contribute to changes in temperatures and weather patterns. But if we compost, separate our food scraps from other trash, it can be made into helpful soil to grow more food. So essentially we are creating a closed loop system from garden or farm or supermarket, wherever we get our food, to table, table to compost, and compost back to that garden or farm again. In order to make compost, we need to mix your leftovers, like banana peels and pizza crust, with dry leaves and twigs. Pile them up in a separate bucket from your regular trash can. Then, over time, billions of tiny creatures break the pile down into soil. And at big composting sites, the piles can even reach temperatures up to 140 degrees. And after it's broken down, it's time to sift the dirt to get rid of any unwanted material. And essentially, we're just getting that fine, finished compost that's ready to use in our garden beds. Experts are urging kids and grown-ups to compost when possible. And here in LA, it's now required. They're asking everyone to separate their green waste, like your fruits and veggies, from other trash. Curbside pickup and these green bins will be made available to make it as easy as possible. Kids like Caden Valentino Wells and his family are doing their part. So at home, so after breakfast, there's a ton of extra eggshells. And what we do with the eggshells, we save it for a week. And then every Friday, we grind it with the other soil we get at Home Depot. So we grind it and then we replace it with some of the other soils. We have it already in the plants. In this composting class, students gather dry leaves, mash food scraps, pile them up, and sift through the dirt. Oh, another one too. Greeting critters along the way. Even worms play an important role. They chip away to the, um, the fruits, the decomposed fruits and uh, sticks and dirt. 
So how do the students feel after they compost? Um, I've known firsthand how empowered the students feel through this process because I've even had parents come back to me and tell me that lesson you did last week was awesome. They raved about it and couldn't stop talking about it. Once they understand the full cycle of this whole thing, then they automatically become invested. And there are plenty of ways to compost at home. If you don't have a backyard, you can store scraps in your freezer. That way, it keeps icky smells and fruit flies away. You can then take your collection to a local compost hub or mix it with soil for your house plants. You can make a small difference that ultimately is kind of a big one. <laughs>
They can get quite big. So our adult male Jabari, who's about five years old, weighs over 450 pounds. Wow, big And guy. our adult female, Zari, who's the mom of the three cubs, she's about 350 pounds. And their growth rate is amazing. The cub's older brother, his name is Peely Peely, he just turned one this year, and he's already over 230 pounds. So that growth rate, psh, is pretty high. These are wild animals and we respect that. So when we started, you mentioned pride and, and cubs that live in the wild, they usually live with their mom and dad and other lions and it's called a pride. Can you explain a little bit more about that structure? Yeah, African lions live in prides, and it's a really unique family and social coalition. The females, adult females, are very well bonded, and actually they kind of rule the roost in terms of uh, managing the adult males. And, you know, a female, when she becomes pregnant, will actually seclude herself, sometimes, you know, um, at a slight distance from the pride, and the cubs won't emerge until they've, you know, gotten big enough to really crawl around and explore and uh, that's about three months old and so that's exactly what you're seeing here at Lincoln Park Zoo with the emergence of these three new cubs. And I understand for kids and grown-ups who are not able to visit the zoo in person they can actually view habitats like this one from the cubs from their home. Oh my gosh it's so exciting we're really excited now that we've got webcams that are running and live streaming our lion habitat, our Jamaican iguana habitat, our Japanese macaque or snow monkeys, um, among others. Well, Maureen, we really appreciate you talking about this and helping us understand these cubs. As you may know, I spent a lot of years living in Chicago, just a few blocks from Lincoln Park Zoo. I have a lot of great memories of taking my boys there. So thanks for what you guys continue to do and to educate us about all these animals. Great to have you on the program. Thank you so much, and we miss you too, Lester. <laughs> Take care. Well, it was a golden moment in Massachusetts recently as one group of four-legged friends came together to honor one of their own. Our good friend Aaron McLaughlin has more on the golden retrievers who are capturing the hearts of America. They're lovable, <laughs> affectionate, hello, <laughs> and so doggone cute. <laughs> Golden Retrievers, a popular breed, especially among this group. <laughs> this is Blue. Blue is two and a half. There's just something about the breed. You know, they're, they're so pure, they're so genuine, they're so loving, and they're just the best friends. They have energy, yes, but they can also be your best friend and lay on the couch all day, um, as Kona is showing right here. <laughs> it's amazing how you can go from being in a bad mood to just laughing and being, I mean, she cracks me up all day long. Goldens are my life. Just days ago, a golden moment took place. About 200 golden retrievers and their owners gathered by the finish line of the Boston Marathon to pay tribute to one of their own, Spencer, the Boston Marathon dog who sadly passed away earlier this year. It's pretty powerful, actually. It's actually very powerful. The Massachusetts Golden Meetups group decided to do a special walk in his honor. For us, it means getting together with the Golden community and supporting Spencer. Spencer became the official race dog after video of him holding Boston strong flags went viral several years ago. On Sunday, many of the four-legged participants were wearing bandanas with the slogan, Golden Strong. Recent years, everyone can use a smile. And I think, I mean, who better than Golden Retrievers to bring that smile? Smiles are contagious when you're around these pups. Hopefully our dog will be the next Spencer and uh, cheer people along. I don't know what I'd do without them. This is Millie. She's a silly little girl. <laughs> this is uh, Cruiser and Bentley and they work here at Rentham Police with me. This is Rocket, he's from Needham Police Department. Cruiser, Rocket, and Rebel also took part in the walk. Just a few of several community resource dogs helping police in towns across the state. It's a specially trained dog that can go around and can interact with students and families and members of the community and help uh, during crises. A dog can always help make things better. More popular than I could have ever thought. This is Bodie, and he's two and a half and I'm training him to be a therapy dog. Yeah. There's a special connection among the golden community. There's something special about people who are, are drawn to, to golden retrievers. Golden retriever community is such a, such a tight-knit community. We feel like everyone's goldens are ours. Chesney, Riley, and Winston. They are a totally different mold. They are so pure at heart. They are so loving. 
They bring people together. I swear there's a certain type of person that is drawn to golden retrievers. So this is Patty. He's the happiest boy. And he loves the microphone. <laughs> a special breed bringing people together and spreading joy wherever they go. Going strong! Aaron, that was great and I love those bandanas. Finally, in our inspiring kids series, a fourth grade class is turning a history lesson into action, trying to bring an important piece of American history back home to Utah. It's small enough to hold in your hand, but at one time connected a continent together. This small golden spike was part of one of the greatest achievements of the 19th century. And now one fourth grade class in Utah wants to bring it back home. The spikes are really important. The history behind them is really important too. To understand the history, you need to go back, way back to the 1800s to a place called Promontory Point in Utah. Fourth grader Jersey explains. Hi, I'm Jersey and 1869, after six years of hard labor, the final track of the Transcontinental Railroad was laid. People could now travel across the country in a few days instead of weeks or months. Four spikes were used in a ceremony on May 10, 1869, when the railroad was completed in Utah. It was a big deal. They are very important parts of Utah history. They help make Utah the crossroads of the West. The Golden Spike was the last one used to join the rails of the first transcontinental railroad, connecting the East and West coasts. But years later, this important piece of American history would wind up in another state. To them in California, it's no big deal. And to us in Utah, it's, it's really big. The Golden Spike is housed in this case at Stanford University's Cantor Art Center in California. Why California? Well, the Golden Spike was privately owned by Leland Stanford, and he founded the university that bears his name. People visit the museum at Stanford University. They might not know what the spike is when they see it. There is no plaque, no explanation of what they're looking at or anything explaining its history. And that really puzzled me. Because to us, it's a huge deal. It's like a big part of Utah history. Uh, and we, we learn about it each year in fourth grade. Teacher Mr. Pendleton went to see the spike in California. It really seemed to be that important to them. Uh, and so in that moment, I had the idea, well, I could make this a writing assignment each year with my class. So what started as a class assignment quickly turned into a full-on crusade. Today we are kicking off a statewide letter writing campaign spikes to Utah. This will probably be the toughest assignment I've ever done because I've never done anything bigger than this. Spikes to Utah! Spikes to Utah! Spikes to Utah was formed. The students know getting this artifact back to Utah is no small feat. But with the anniversary approaching, the students are hoping they can encourage kids and grown-ups from across the country to send in letters of support. Regardless of the outcome, this is something that hopefully they'll remember for, for the rest of their lives. Um, and, and the idea of engaging in, in the civic discourse and, and learning how to be an activist for things that you care about is important. Together we can bring the spikes to Utah. Spikes to Utah! Spikes to Utah! Well, that's going to do it for us parents. Just a reminder, if your child has a question about any topic in the news, email a video to us at nightlynewskids at nbcuni.com. You can also follow us on Instagram at nightlykids. And just a program note, you can catch a new episode of Nightly News Kids Edition every Thursday on nbcnews.com and YouTube and streaming on the weekends on NBC News Now. Thanks for watching. Remember to take care of yourself and each other. Have a great weekend.